Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session on on newer updates on the vascular AMD management. I would like to invite uh, the panelists to come up on stage. Dr. Cyrus Shroff, Dr. George Manayat, Ms. Nivas Joshi, Dr. Mahesh, also Chaitra is already here with me. Nivas and Mahesh here. Um, so we'll start off with the session today. Uh, it's our honor and pleasure to have Dr. Amar Safar as a first speaker. He's the chief medical officer and uh, ER surgeon at Moorfields Eye Hospital, Dubai, UAE. And uh, he has uh, trained in the US, held various positions there. Uh, he trained at Georgetown University in Washington, DC. The uh, University of Texas Southwestern. He held the post of Chief of Retina and Vitreous Surgery at University of Arkansas uh, for nine years. There are numerous uh, chapters and publications to his credit uh, and includes uh, work with the DRCR as well as uh, um, Eritz piece. I now invite him to I'll give his talk on fight the fluid and changing treatment landscape in neovascular AMD. Over to you, Dr. Amar Safar. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much uh, for uh, having me uh, early in the morning uh, at seven o'clock in Dubai. I'm very, very happy and pleased to be with you guys here uh, to uh, participate in this meeting. And thanks again for Novartis for the very kind invitation. I will go ahead and start sharing my slides. You can please just confirm that you can see it. So yes, I can Excellent. we Thank can you. see it. Okay. Uh, I have no financial interest in anything I'll be discussing, although I do consult for all uh, three companies that you saw up there. So what I wish to hopefully go over this morning is to talk a little bit uh, about new horizons in the management of uh, new vascular AMD, specifically Brolucizumab, with the introduction of Brolucizumab in the market uh, as one of the tools we have to fight new vascular AMD. But mainly I'd like to show you some of uh, my cases that I actually started with uh, in the management of uh, Brolucizumab and hopefully uh, create a discussion at one point uh, if, uh, if the time permits. So as we all know, Brolucizumab is a uh, a, a new product taking all of the uh, the very familiar uh, antibody molecule that we have but actually taking the most active and the smallest active unit uh, and uh, engineering it in a way that this unit actually can be packed into a very small amount of uh, fluid that will be ultimately injected in the eye the the different uh, uh, you know the difference in this molecule is that it is small and engineered in a way that you can actually pack 12 times more molecules in the same volume of fluid that you were injecting into the eye which obviously ultimately creates a very high uh, affinity and potency in binding to the uh, receptors and preventing the from doing the bad things uh, that it does uh, when it's upregulated in the neovascular uh, AMD uh, patient. So, uh, as we have been discussing in the past couple of years, so what is the importance of fluid uh, in AMD? Should we tolerate some fluid or not? Um, as you probably know, there is a lot of uh, uh, talk and research about uh, whether some fluid can be actually protective in the course uh, or the context of um, neovascular AMD, especially if it's subretinal fluid. Um, and I think that the latest uh, research that you could find when you do your, uh, your searches, including what was presented at the American Academy of Ophthalmology last October, is that actually uh, fluid is not good in any compartment, whether the intraretinal, subretinal, or sub-RPE uh, uh, fluid. All of them are indications of disease activity. Now, in the past, uh, we used to like, not like to, but we used to have to tolerate this uh, fluid because 
it wasn't really going away with anything we do. Um, so any medication that we had available to inject was unable to relieve or, uh, or re re you know, reduce the amount or, or re completely eliminate the amount of fluid uh, that we wanted to eliminate. But I think things may have been uh, changing in the uh, past couple of years. So what I'm going to show you here is some data from the Hawk and Harry, which was post hoc analysis, to basically show you the superiority of Rolicizumab compared to Aflibercept, for example, because this is what was used uh, against in uh, Hawk and Harrier um, uh, in the management of uh, the subretinal fluid. So here, you take all this uh, uh, data, you have two studies with a massive amount of OCTs, actually 41,000 plus OCTs, and you try to um, subject them to a predetermined algorithms to decide what is the difference. So when you look at the intraretinal fluid, you can see here, a fever set here in, in this graph is always green, and rolisuzumab, whether it's three milligram or six milligram, are in the purple or uh, red. So in the intraretinal fluid, you would see that they're identical, basically, uh, no, no major differences. But when you look at the subretinal fluid, you start seeing that uh, a very sharp uh, see, uh, you know, seesaw uh, appearance of the fever set, which we are used to, and also you see that superiority of reduction of the subretinal fluid. Uh, for rolicizumab versus the aflibercept. This is actually where things look significantly different is when you look at the pigment epithelial detachment or the sub-RPE fluid, you start seeing a major separation between these two lines, indicative of a superior activity on the role or on the side of uh, rolicizumab. Here, you know, when you look at the data, uh, more individualized, for the induction phase versus the maintenance phase, you can also see the big difference in the, in the hawk and in the harrier. You can see the big difference between the uh, uh, patients who are receiving brolicizumab versus patients who are receiving aflibercept. So there is a clear uh, superiority. This is, uh, again, uh, in the sub-RPE fluid. Uh, you can see that happening over and over again. So you can actually uh, conclude from that that as far as the intraretinal fluid, it is actually, if anything, it's the same, uh, but definitely not worse than a paper cell. But when we're looking at the sub-RPE and sub-retinal fluid compartments, both of them, uh, brolicizumab had a uh, definite superiority over a fever cell in, re in resolving this fluid. So that could potentially cause us uh, or give us the ability to give a much longer uh, treatment with uh, less injection intervals between uh, uh, one injection and the other, which obviously will reduce the burden on both the patient and uh, the um, doctor. So let's go now into the cases um, and share some of the cases that I had, uh, uh, you know, a, a significant improvement in, and, and maybe we'll discuss them if you would like. The first case is a 78-year-old male with new vascular AMD in the left eye, vision in the right eye 2030, uh, left eye is 2080 normal anterior segment with mild uh, cataracts, and uh, dry changes in the right eye. So the patient usually receives four previous uh, uh, of injection in the left eye. If you look at his uh, uh, OCT, there's this subretinal fluid, and there is this sub-RPE fluid. So the patient continues to get his aflibercept, which is resolving the subretinal sub fluid, but really not touching the sub-RPE, as you can see. Again, a little bit of fluid here, but that dark area that you see in the sub-RPE space is not really changing as we are progressing with his treatment. Um, this is one of the worst times where he came. This was, I think, uh, right after a, the, the corona um, uh, lockdown where he couldn't make it for a while and he had this area. Again, uh, sub-retinal fluid, but the sub-RPE is not changed. And then basically, the patient actually heard that there is a new medication uh, that has been just approved and he asked to be switched to it. After a long discussion with him, we went ahead and did that. And for the first time, you can see the difference between on your left, where the RPE was not touched with anything before, and now it's uh, finally starting to actually flatten down with one injection. And this is him here, 20, uh, down to 2040. And then uh, he was extended to uh, uh, Q12 injections of rolicizumab. Case number two is a 74-year-old male who continues uh, to have injections in the right eye of a uh, for neovascular AMD. 
His left eye was okay, no problems, 2030 vision. Anterior segment has a mild nuclear sclerosis in the right eye. Uh, left eye is uh, pseudophagic. And he has dry changes, like I said, in the left eye. This is his left eye, typical of a dry AMD chain. Uh, unfortunately, not for too long. A uh, patient came in after a few uh, weeks complaining that the left eye now is also not uh, doing quite well, as we typically um, see. And you can see here that the main component is in the sub-RPE uh, uh, fluid, if we're talking fluid only. Um, and the intraretinal fluid, uh, intraretinal uh, space has uh, a uh, couple of cysts there. So this is baseline. This is how he presented. And of course, since he's getting a fever set in the left eye, and by the way, by then, at, at that point, brolocizumab was not available. We uh, started him with the fever set which did quite well initially uh, and, uh, you know, flattened the, uh, the uh, RPE as much as possible, not completely, but significant. Uh, the patient actually then traveled to his home country, no injection, then came back like this, got number three and number four. The problem with this patient is in this slide. So as you can see here, the dates from April to October of 2020, which you would recall this is the height of the COVID uh, uh, crisis. Um, the patient was actually, he's in his mid 70s or late 70s, he was showing up to clinic every month and getting a flibercep injection every month. And you could agree with me, I think, that there is really no effect. It's like you're um, uh, injecting saline here. Um, this patient was just basically completely not responding to any uh, flibercep anymore, despite the good and robust initial response uh, of the medication. So this is where we were stuck in November of 2020, in his good eye. Um, and then after a long discussion of what do we do, do we continue with this or do we uh, do anything? And at that point, October 2020 actually is when brolocizumab was approved in Dubai. So the decision was to give him the first injection of brolocizumab. Lo and behold, when you look at it after one injection, that's basically the result that we got. Um, significant, this is before and after, as you can see here on the same slide, on the upper uh, picture, there's that uh, stuck, uh, uh, you know, the area where we're stuck in, which is the sub-RPE and uh, intraretinal cyst, which completely resolved after uh, one injection of brolocizumab. The patient also had an improvement in the vision, improvement in the vision had a second brolocizumab, and now he's uh, on three, uh, two, 12 weeks of brolocizumab in the left eye. Case number three. 74-year-old British female presents complaining of seeing a dark spot in her left eye. She is naive, never had any treatment before. Uh, she knows that she has dry macular degeneration, but really never required anything in the past. Um, 2040 is her vision in the left eye. Anterior segment looks okay. When you look at the uh, OCT, it's not very overwhelming actually, but you can see this bumpy uh, uh, sub-RPE space. Um, and when you look at the OCT in geography, uh, you see that there is a lesion that lights up here that could be a polyp. Um, again, we discussed with this patient the uh, options of uh, what can we provide her, uh, whether we give her ILEA, which is sorry, versus uh, brolicizumab at this point. Um, again, I presented her, this is a very uh, nice, very educated lady. I presented her with the potential idea, you know, uh, uh, studies and the super potential superiority of brolicizumab in this case, and that's what we went with. So this is her uh, uh, images or OCT images after the injections. You can see a significant flattening of that uh, uh, area. Um, again, she got the loading dose uh, exactly as uh, on this, in the studies. The patient significantly improved even subjectively. Her visual acuity improved also, but this is a before and after on the same slide where you can actually see again the uh, major improvement uh, that happened in uh, this patient. She was presenting at 2040 and uh, 2025 was her uh, final outcome after the induction. And then she was also uh, maintained at Q12. Not everybody is able to uh, stay at Q12, obviously, but this patient, uh, I, I see her very, you know, on time. And, and actually we went over uh, Q12 because she had to travel back to the uh, UK for uh, some family emergency. Uh, so we had to wait, um, and uh, she still did quite well uh, with that. Uh, case four, 72-year-old female presents complaining of seeing a, a new 
central black shadow in her left eye. She was told that she has a cataract and she needs to go check it out. Um, so she comes in, no significant medical history, very heavy smoker, you can tell from her uh, voice. Um, vision is 2070. And she, yes, she does have a cataract, significant cataract, uh, but she also has this on the OCT in the left eye. So again, a significant amount of uh, uh, some RPE uh, fluid, trim also there. OCT uh, and geography shows the uh, very nice uh, complex of uh, new vessels, as you can see here. With one injection of uh, brodicizumab, uh, again, this flattened out very nicely. Um, you can see here before and after. And uh, interestingly, also on the OCT and geography, the lesion actually, uh, uh, the flow in it at least, uh, completely disappeared uh, after one injection. Unfortunately, this patient was lost to follow up. She went back to her home country and never really came back uh, for me to see what happened with her. But, uh, but I think that was a very, uh, you know, wow effect for me to see uh, on, the, on this patient. Now, obviously, you can say, okay, great. So you have a very, uh, you know, powerful medication, but how about the, the uh, big elephant in the hole? Um, you know, we're all thinking about the, the uh, safety issues. What, what do we, uh, you know, do otherwise? If there were no safety concerns, probably we would add it to the drinking water, you know? But uh, there are always, unfortunately, with everything that's quite powerful, uh, there is a higher potential for more problems. Um, I always like to, you know, give this uh, uh, analogy. If you have a pistol, uh, it is powerful, but um, has some risks. You have to actually uh, be careful and, and take care of it. But if you have a, a machine gun, it is very, very powerful. You can achieve a lot more with it. But of course, with that, can uh, you, you will have another set of uh, potential problems and you need to be more careful when you're having a machine gun versus a pistol. So the same you know, th uh, thinking I try to apply here, you have a medication that I believe is a, a lot more potent and effective in drying out the retina. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is something that a comp you know, pharmaceutical companies may not like, but I honestly believe that uh, these kinds of medications need to be used by trained physicians, retina specialists, not by anybody or not by general ophthalmologists who, uh, you know, who probably might not recognize what is an IOI. So the main IOI, uh, uh, main problem obviously is the IOI, intraocular inflammation, and more so than that is the uh, potential vasculitis. So uh, the, the idea is that now we have some, um, you know, things that we can at least uh, look out for. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend it in anybody that has a history of uveitis uh, or history of inflammation, intraocular inflammation. We know now that females with history of uh, uveitis are actually a highest risk of uh, uh, IOI. So I would definitely avoid uh, using it in these patients. Uh, of course, if multiple allergies, uh, those are also patients could potentially uh, be prone to having uh, intraocular uh, inflammation. Um, and of course, educate your patient and advise them to report any sudden changes in the vision. It's actually quite interesting that uh, one thing I want you to understand is I was, when I first started using bronyosism, I was so focused on uh, trying to avoid having a, a problem that I missed in these patients. And I did have one case who actually was injected with a aflibercept uh, that had an IOI. I was focused so on, on, on uh, brolisuzumab and, and got it from, uh, you know, <laughs> stabbed in the back by, by a flibercept. So my point here is that those medications are antibodies in general. So they do um, actually incite some infl inflammatory reaction in our eye. It's only if it's exaggerated to the point that causes uh, problems is when we need to actually interfere. And how do we interfere? We interfere depending on um, there's a very nice paper, depending on the symptoms and presentation, there's a, there's a nice uh, review paper that summarizes when do you do what. But basically, the idea is you have a sterile inflammation and you need to use steroids. Um, I would say if you have somebody that comes in with a complaint of seeing the large floaters, strands, things like that, then go ahead and do a dilated, a very good dilated exam. If you see vitritis, if you see any sheathing, anything like that, you need to do ultra-wide field photography and or fluorescein angiogram. 
And if you uh, see that any, any uh, you know, alarming signs, then at that point you need to start the steroids, whether topical, subtenone, oral is also a possibility. Ozerdex has been uh, used and uh, 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 given good results. Uh, I would reserve vitrectomy to the very, very advanced cases where you feel like it's almost an endothermitis case, which I've really never seen, uh, uh, thank God. So basically, my take-home message from this is that uh, this is a very effective, very uh, potent medication that has a superior reduction in uh, intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, and specifically on sub-RPE fluid. Uh, and as we all know, uh, the data shows, which I didn't really show you today, but uh, these are all post hoc analyses that have been done on the Hawken Harrier, that the earlier you uh, dry the fluid, the better patient uh, vision is at the long, in the long run. Uh, so you need to actually uh, try and make sure that you achieve that goal as much as possible. Now we have a medication that uh, can actually help us achieve that and we do not need to tolerate any uh, fluid in any compartment uh, because they are all pathological uh, and we need to achieve an anatomical outcome back to normal as soon as possible to give the patient, patient the best uh, possible uh, vision. And again, at the same time, reducing the frequency uh, of uh, of this use of this medication. I know this is not approved in your country for uh, DME, but I have been having very, very uh, successful patients, uh, treating them with really very few injections, completely dry. Uh, uh, and, and, and again, it needs to be used by someone who has a good experience in it. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, be happy to have any questions or discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Safar, for very nice uh, presentation with wonderful cases that you uh, showed to prove your points of uh, how effective it is. And certainly it has a wow effect in terms of the pigment epithelial detachment. Before we move on to questions, I'm sure there can be a lot of debate on this. I, I would just like to add one point. I've been told that uh, Brolicizumab got approval for DME just a few days ago so uh, in India so I think it's on label for DME now uh, but coming back to you Dr. Safar um, the cases where you see a wow effect and it's probably quite different from all the other anti-VEGF agents is the sub RP fluid as you showed in the detailed analysis of the Hawk and Harrier trial uh, the question is how uh, important is sub RP fluid in terms of visual acuity change for our patients? Should we be concerned about sub RP fluid and proactively treat that in eyes which don't have intraretinal or subretinal fluid? Because we know from various other studies, the intraretinal fluid is the most detrimental than subretinal fluid, but there has been no debate about PED earlier. What are your thoughts on the RP fluid now that we have brolicizumab? That's an excellent question um, and exactly highlights the point I was trying to make. Um, so in the past, when we were unable to actually resolve the sub RPE fluid, um, we were basically saying, well, it's not that bad anyway. It doesn't induce a neurosensory detachment. Uh, vision is okay. Yes, maybe there will be a refractive uh, shift because the retina and the RPE are both moving forward. Then, you know, we can tolerate it. Um, but it is an indication, uh, and there are studies now that are showing or being published uh, emerging that uh, uh, indicates uh, that the presence of sub-RPE fluid is not a normal state. Um, we never tolerate it, uh, you know, uh, if we can, but if we can't, we used to actually say, well, it's the, the, the least potential evil, if you will, and it's okay to actually tolerate it. Um, so I think that you will see now that there is a medication that can, uh, that is powerful. Now, again, it's not 100% effective. I'm, I'm, please don't understand me as it is a 100% a effectivity. Of course, nothing is 100%, but it's definitely a lot more effective in resolving this RPE fluid, uh, I think you will start seeing more and more studies indicating the importance of that, at least um, to show the, the fact that there is some disease activity. I'll give you an example. Uveitis. If you speak to uveitis specialists, they tell you, I do like, not like to tolerate any uh, uh, 
uh, cells in the in the anterior chamber. I feel that those could act, this, they indicate a low grade inflammatory reaction happening in the eye. That was I remember that from Steve Foster in Boston. He used to say I would not tolerate a single cell in the anterior chamber. Okay, that got stuck in my mind, indicating why is that? Why is he not tolerating a couple of cells floating in the anterior chamber while the vision is 2020? Because he knows that there is a low grade inflammatory reaction happening, causing eating up in the vision over maybe five, 10 years, you might have some, uh, uh, some problem. And again, this is all anecdotal, uh, but again, uh, this is how you ask how, what's my thought about it, and that's what I think about. Thank you. Uh, oh, there may be many other questions. Anybody from the audience can also post it on the computer. Um, um, I'll have uh, one question uh, to Dr. George Manayat. On the number of injections that in India are giving compared to, let's say, what's on label, that you have to give a loading dose, as we saw Dr. Suffer give loading dose. Um, but in India, a lot of people tend to follow one plus PR, and it has a wow effect. And, and as soon as it dries up, we generally are not loading. Uh, what's your take on that? Are you afraid of any inflammation in giving monthly injections of borolicizumab? Uh, or do you just hold back on this? Yeah, actually, um, now after the Merlin study and results are out, and uh, you all know that this drug is very potent, I do not uh, use this drug uh, like the other loading doses. So after the first injection, my second injection would be at least two months apart. For the second, not a monthly loading dose. And from there, I try to make it once in three months. So uh, this is the this is the best schedule for a patient who is uh, you know treatment switched patients. Always everybody look at the response and take it forward. Actually, if I have to t start a patient knife patient with neovascular AMD with uh, or PCV, we see a lot of PCVs here. So if for some reason I have to try it and on a knife patient uh, first. The second would be at least two months and then try to make it once in three months. So it's sort of a treat and extend wherein once in three months, if I see that the activity by three months is you know recurring, then we have to tailor it from that side onwards. So at three months, if it's active, probably my fourth injection would be at two and a half months. So you know it's 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 a it's a, it's like a tailored to that particular patient in a treat and extend fashion. Uh, so, Dr. Safar, uh, this is the question I brought in to give the Indian perspective at this point of time. We have probably given about 20,000 injections in India, um, but people have not been given a loading dose in general. Um, and, and from day one, we look at the fluid. If there's no fluid, we just hold back and extend. Uh, what are your thoughts on having a loading dose from the beginning, uh, I mean uh, a PRN from beginning or do you always follow a strict loading dose and then PRN? No, I don't actually, I don't. Uh, and, and what I showed you were early cases as you could tell from the date. Uh, I showed you early cases of uh, when I started using Brodicizumab. We didn't really know much about uh, this medication as far as its efficacy in the clinic and you know real life uh, use is totally different than studies sometimes but what i do right now is very similar to, to dr george uh, which is tailoring it to each patient uh, the only thing is i do not put a uh, an actual date so dr george was saying my second injection is at least two months um what i will say and uh, what will change is that i would uh, dry them out, you know. Uh, so if they are dry after the second injection, I immediately go to extend. Uh, I don't have to give them all the the the, the loading do the loading phase. Um, but I I kind of if, if they're not dry, then I will give them the uh, monthly injection until they are dry. Uh, but uh, I've found that they are uh, a lot more uh, reaching the dry state much much faster than what I'm used to with aflibercept. Um, especially with DME, to be honest with you, now that we, you guys have it also approved. With DME, it's just really amazing. Like, you know, one injection and boom, everything is so dry. And all of a sudden you can go like, okay, now I can immediately have you maybe come back in three months and get another injection, if any. Um, and I, I understand that, uh, you know, we like to go with uh, evidence-based uh, data 
But sometimes patients just decide to get the injections whenever they can or they, they, whenever they can afford even also. Um, so I know this is always a, a, an issue. That's why I'm saying uh, results usually sometimes are different in real life than, uh, than in, uh, but I totally agree. I, I do not. And again, that goes back to my point. Why should we, uh, um, you know, uh, the safety is one thing, but also this is a medication that requires a lot of experience, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, talent in, in how to use it. Uh, um, and, and, and that's why I feel like uh, retina specialists should be uh, the ones to use this medication, not uh, general ophthalmologist, with all due respect. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. George, you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I have a question to uh, Dr. Amma because uh, we uh, have not seen a lot of uh, intraocular inflammations here, at least what is reported actually. So, at least for us and for the audience, what would be your, suppose you have a post anterior segment inflammation, you already mentioned aggressive topical steroids. But then if you have a patient with vitritis or vasculitis, which any, any one of us can have, in that situation, your first take, whether it would be a systemic steroids or a dex implant or a, a vitrectomy, how to go about in that situation, you have confirmed it with a, a wide field uh, photo or uh, angiography. In that situation, what would, what would be the first step to take and how do we uh, manage it? If I can just add to George's question, uh, we have seen vitritis being reported, but we haven't seen occlusive vasculitis or a CRO or touch food for us. So if you have a patient, uh, Dr. Safar, of uh, extensive vasculitis or a uh, Exclusive vasculitis, how would you go about managing? Even a subtle vasculitis proven on angio. Yeah. Um, touch wood again, uh, I have not had one, but what I would do if I had one of those, um, if the patient is pseudophagic, I would um, consider a DEX implant as a primary. Uh, I've, man I've co managed a patient uh, from a man, Jordan, um, who I never saw. <laughs> But her, uh, her son kept, uh, you know, sending me pictures and WhatsApp and all of that. And I kept saying them, let your doctor in Amman actually manage her. But uh, uh, we ended up, you know, co-managing her, if you will. And we did a, a DEX implant uh, on this lady who uh, actually did quite well with the uh, DEX implant. She had a little bit of uh, uh, sheathing, uh, no occlusive disease. But, um, but just sheathing on the uh, vessels in the periphery and quite a bit of vitritis. Um, that all resolved and uh, actually she, she did not lose any vision from that particular problem. But I think a DEX implant makes a lot of sense, um, even if they are not uh, uh, pseudophagic, to be honest with you. But if they're pseudophagic at this age, it would make it even less of a, an issue for us. Thank you, Dr. Safar. I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next speaker because we'll have questions after that also, very similar questions probably. Uh, I now invite Dr. Gopal Pillai to give a talk on durability with brolizumab here, cases to show. Uh, thank you very much, Raja. So this is about durability with brolizumab. Uh, under treatment in the real world setting is the basic problem of suboptimal visual equities. As you can see, even in the randomized control trials, as well as the real world experience, as the number of injections go down, visual equity gain significantly reduces. Like more than 5.1 injections is required to maintain a visual equity, and more than 7.9 injections are required to improve the visual equity. This is what the real world evidence suggests. And many people stop treatment and drop out of the uh, treatment arm one major reason would be financial, another would be distance between home, hospital, all those logistics, dissatisfaction and no regular follow-up results. So despite visual equity decline in the long term, which we know, complete vision loss is generally prevented in a regular anti of treatment. So if you are continuing the anti of treatment, there will be a very, very small subset of patients who actually lose vision completely. There will be most of them will have vision. And uh, physicians identify the need for long-lasting therapies like more than 40 to 40 percentage want a long-lasting treatment and insufficient fluid resolution is the most important clinical reason to switch anti of therapy according to about 50 to 60 percent of the physicians. They are still seeking improvements that are not provided by the current anti of therapies. These are all from the PAT surveys of uh, ASRS. So retinal fluid 
is the leading indicator, be it in diagnosis. Diagnosis, obviously, presence of intraretinal fluid, subretinal fluid, and sub RPE fluid is the key to diagnosis. Time to first treatment between the diagnosis with the first treatment, that gap gives the best prognosis. So, if that gap is less, your prognosis is better. Disease activity, almost all of us looks at uh, fluid to look at disease activity and decide on, uh, you know, re-injections, etc. And uh, if disease activity can be optimized, then only the visual improvement will be there. And so, durable therapies need to be brought to control the fluid. Now, treatment based on retinal fluid detection, like for example, Sailor versus Harbor. In Harbor, any fluid was considered taboo and so we injected. Whereas in Sailor, 100 microns of fluid was considered uh, activity and retreated. So the difference in these two will show us that there is a significant, uh, when we take any fluid, the results are much, much better. So Brolizumab is in fact a long acting disease like Hawk and Harrier showed us uh, in which uh, uh, Q12 uh, dosing of Brolizumab versus Q8 dosing of Aflibercep actually showed us that about 50% of patients were maintained on on about 12 weekly or three monthly regimen for a long period of time till week 48 and the predictability is that those patients who were maintained on three monthly uh, brolizumabs till week 48 most of them about 75 to 80 percentage of them continue to receive only three monthly brolizumab further on also so does durability correlate with outcomes definitely yes patients with complete fluid resolution were greater with brolizumab here and patients with consecutive, that's both absence of IRF as well as SRF in visits up to 96 were graded with Brolysis map. Now let us show some uh, real world cases. This one first case uh, uh, presented in May 22 with choroidal neoastral membrane with subretinal hemorrhage and 6 by 60 improving to 6 by 36. This is a subretinal hemorrhage with uh, polyps uh, near the arcade. And uh, there was one Brolysis map which was previously treated with about six uh, injections of Bivasusumab and then loss to follow up for three months and then the patient developed a subretinal hemorrhage and came back and one uh, brolizumab followed by a focal la macular laser and the patient has not had fluid again this is the fluid control the vision did not improve further beyond 6 by 36 but the fluid has not come back at all there's another case in which there is a, a, a amd with a, 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 you know large uh, subretinal bleed but uh, large pigment epithelial detachment, hemorrhagic pigment epithelial detachment was there and ICG showed polyps here again. This is a large pigment epithelial detachments here and ICG is showing uh, polyps there. And uh, this is uh, August 2022, the autofluorescence shows the la large uh, pigment epithelial detachment and mottling there. And this is the large pigment epithelial detachment, what Dr. Raja was and uh, uh, all of us were telling that the pigment epithelial detachments fall down significantly. So between February and March, you can see uh, there was uh, uh, not so much difference. And then by August, the uh, PED completely flattened. And after that, you can see in November, without any further injections, and the visual equity is improved from 6 by 24 to about 6 by 6 parts now. So with very few number of injections, I do not start any patient on, on loading dose. I start with PRN right from the start. And if there is fluid, I may give. But generally, the tendency is to slow down the process. Case 3, again, submacular bleed. You can see that multiple levels of submacular bleed and multiple ages of submacular bleed. Again, polyp was there. And uh, there were multiple nine doses of ranibizumab which was received and not responding. And uh, these, were the, these were the ICG and the uh, FFAs. And these were in 2021 where the patient was on ranibizumab at different uh, areas. You can see the submacular hemorrhage and the activity there. And these were the pigment epithelial attachments. And once we started treatment with uh, brolizumab, you can see that the pigment epithelial attachment came down. And uh, this patient has received two doses of uh, 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 two doses of uh, uh, brolizumab. Now, and again, another case, case with uh, uh, subretinal hemorrhage with uh, polyps just near the disc. So here is a patient post brolizumab injection couple of injections and actually the fluid is significantly coming down and I was planning to laser that uh, polyps near the disc but as actually it flattened away and uh, I did not need to do a focal laser at this point of time. Case 5 again another submacular hemorrhage with large pigment epithelial detachment uh, and uh, you can see those two polyps on ICG and uh, post injection in July and uh, this is the uh, you know the fluid was completely reduced almost a little bit of fluid is remaining. You can see the pigment epithelial attachment here, which completely reduced to this. And then one more injection and it is flat and six by six. A six, larger, uh, you know, a, 
uh, a very large uh, pigment epithelial detachment with polyps again. You can see pre injection is 6 by 18, and then the fluid is completely uh, regressing and regressing. So, in my experience in AMD as well as PCV, both in switch and knife, all patients improved in vision. It was a long term stability and a lot of effect on duration, which means most of the patient requires a second injection by two, two and a half months. One patient had inflammation. I had one patient who had a 6 by 18 which dropped to 3 by 60 with severe vitritis and uh, I had given systemic steroids um, and uh, within a month's time the patient came back to 6 by 18. This is my experience on inflammation as well and I take this opportunity to welcome all of you to Kochi AIOC. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Gopal. A wonderful uh, series of cases with submacular hemorrhage being your theme actually. PD could see the brilliant results uh, with brolicizumab. Um, I have a question for Dr. Cyrus Shroff. Uh, Dr. Shroff, do you have a different protocol for evaluating these patients after injection compared to let's say flibercept or ranibizumab or do you follow the same protocol of calling them back after a month or so? Is there a difference for you? There is a difference and I think possibly for all of us there is a difference. I, I think most of us would be always uh, alert to the possibility of, although it's rare, it's not common, but the possibility of intraocular inflammation. I think these patients have to be counseled not just after the, right from the time you counsel for the injection itself, I think. You tell them that although activity may be more, it's likely to be more, uh, there is that small possibility of uh, intraocular inflammation which the patient must be prepared for mentally to accept that. And uh, subsequently also I think we like to see them uh, the first uh, post-injection day and then alert them to the possibility of symptoms uh, of, of symptoms of intraocular inflammation. We probably at least at the first injection also like to see them after a week and then uh, after a month. Uh, so I think the, the other thing I, I just wanted to point, point out, I think we, the question of sub RP fluid, I think which Dr. Safar also mentioned, I think we should not go away with the message that all sub RP fluid needs to be kind of treated because I think it's the etiology also that's important. I mean, the, you can have sub RP fluid in serious PEDs and wouldn't go around treating every uh, RP attachment that way. So I think one would, so similarly, where there is a PCV involvement, you may, the, the approach may be totally different. So I think you have to see where and in what etiology the sub RP fluid is decide also how much you're going to go after that. Yeah, so maybe I would like to bring in Dr. Safar here. Is there a kind of sub RP? Uh, Raja, I would just like to mention here that before, when we have having vivacizumab as well as uh, ranibizumab, we're not chasing our sub RP fluid because it wouldn't go away. We're only looking at activity like uh, intraretinal or subretinal fluid. Now with the newer anti vegfs definitely yes. We, we are able to bring down that to a significant level. So we are not chasing it, but it is reducing. I don't know whether we should take it as activity and actively treat that. Dr. Safar, uh, would you like to add something to it? Uh, that sub RP fluid is uh, of as bad as the other compartment fluids or? It's anything? not as bad. It's definitely not as bad. We know that it's not as bad. Uh, but at the same time, it does indicate disease activity. And as Dr. Uh, Pillay was just saying, uh, if we have a medication that uh, is more potent in resolving it, then we at least give it a try. Now, if it doesn't go away with the producer's map and we have nothing stronger than it right now, then I wouldn't just keep chasing it because it's there. I always say to my patients, I'd like to treat you, not the OCT. I don't want to try to uh, treat the OCT only. I want to treat you. But uh, again, uh, again, to the same point of, uh, not every, you, know, you have to look at the context. If you have a, a, a normal, you know, uh, serious PED uh, in a context of, I don't know, uh, CSR or something like that, then I wouldn't change it, of course. But, but in the context of, of uh, AMD, neovascular AMD, when you have compartments uh, that have uh, fluid in all of them, subretinal, subRPE, sub, uh, uh, or intraretinal, 
and then you have a medication now that can help you with resolve all three of them, I would, I would be aggressive trying to uh, uh, resolve all of them, to be honest with you. But I want to have a question, if you don't mind. Do I have time to ask a question to Dr. Sure. Pillay? Sure. Dr. Pillay, so thank you so much for your cases. Very, very, very nice cases, wonderful cases. Um, I just was wondering if you had any uh, cases of RPE rips. You have these big, huge RPEs. Uh, um, so have you had any experience where uh, RPE actually ripped? Uh, I have I have I have had RP rips before, but uh, my numbers in Brolisumab is not so much to have that RP rip now. So yes, there is always this risk because when you are when your large PDs are suddenly coming down, that is when the highest risk is there. But fortunately for me, till now it is not there. But I have had rips with Avastin as well as uh, Ranibizumab as well as Aflibizumab. So it's only a time it will catch up with Brolisumab as well. Yeah, well, touch wood. Yeah, yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so, but I, it was good to see that you were not beating around the bush with these large PEDs. You went straight for bolosismab, got them flattened out. That was nice to see. I have a question for Srinivas. In, in fact, it's an audience question from Dr. Shahana. Uh, is I know you have used beyond AMD also. So, is do you think there is a higher risk of inflammation? It's saying DME because there may be a role for inflammation there. Do you see any problem with DME? Uh, question sir i think uh, just got approval for fda approval for dme as well if i'm not wrong i think they are just now with the ecgi to get a clearance in india as well I they think. got it uh, they got it recently uh, to be frank off label i have used it in inflammatory cnvms also in a young boy because it was not working with any other anti vegf i tried uh, uh, bevacizumab i tried a flibercept it was not working so the only choice left for me in that inflammatory cnvm guy i know it was very uh, <laughs> i was taking a, a very risky step here but i counseled that patient because it was a large peripapillary cnvm and what i noticed was first time i saw there is a regressing part even on the octa of this inflammatory cnvm but i did not have any vitritis in that case but although I had one or two vitritis in other cases of uh, neovascular AMD, but it went away well. But the initial one week, the patient, as Cyrus sir said, we should bring the protocol of seeing them uh, early, at least within a week. Uh, but what I have seen is, uh, recently I had a patient which said that I had very uh, little pain, uh, discomfort was there. But when I looked into the OCT, there was a, a very good response of regressing the sub-RP fluid, that is the FIPED, I saw the height of the FIPED had come down, the OCTA network had come down and the vision had also improved. But that initial few days the patient did complain that there was a few discomfort. I asked that was the flashes and floaters but that was only for a week and after that uh, it went away. Srinivas, did you so, treat the patient with vitritis with systemic steroids or no, topical steroids? Only topical steroids because in, in I think we have given now around 300 injections with Prolizuzumab. But in none of these cases, I have given any systemic steroids because it dies away. It's only that initial phase, if at all, the patient has. And it's such a potent drug. I am always scared to hit, it, hit on it again and again and uh, making it to inside the inflammation. Why unnecessarily to do that? Because when it, we are giving a good response with the, the uh, PD itself, which we have not seen in any other anti -VEGF. at least I have not seen uh, the, such a dramatic response with the uh, PDs coming down. So I usually go slow and uh, even in the naive cases I have also started, even in DME, uh, vein occlusions I have also used. Uh, but the duration of action I see is slightly better as compared to the, the other anti um, Although I have not done a head-on comparison with Brolizumab versus Ozurdex because that's also has a very good response of over three, three and a half months. But here I have seen around three to five months of duration uh, acting very well even in the, the rest of the cases as well. Uh, do you have any brief comment? Yeah, so everybody is talking about when to keep your guard up when you're giving brolicizumab. So when do you actually let your guard down? After how many injections or do you never let your guard down? I mean, I'm sure all of us have at least about two years of experience of using the drug. Do you ever let your guard down? Because the, I think after the first injection, I don't really worry myself other than counseling the patient to come back, if any, because we do know that it's not just the first injection that can cause the... Usually the second or the third, which process it. When do you just uh, exactly. you know, start treating it like any other drug and say, you know, you don't have to, you don't worry as a physician. So then let's have a kind of uh, more poll like, uh, so what is the maximum number of brolicism I have as an 
anybody give one 10 anybody wants to raise their hand here audience anybody five in a single patient yeah in, in one in one patient yeah one eye one eye yeah not, nobody has crossed 10 at this point of time here, yeah. maybe in two years. There's, so. a, there's, a, there's a hand raise, sir. 10? Okay, so that, that speaks a lot about what we are probably looking at. But in the interest of time, I think we need to move ahead uh, with the next presentation. We we'll have questions later. So I now invite Dr. Devdulal Chakravarti has the uh, most probable uh, experience in India, prolysis map, and uh, he'll be talking on management of peace real world experience. I think uh, VRSI and uh, Novartis for this opportunity. So I'll be speaking about PCV and Indian experience, uh, our experience basically with prolysis map. So this is the disclaimer. And uh, the first question first, uh, why are we talking about PCV? Well, basically because if you do multimodal imaging in our patients, probably half of them would be, you know, PCV. So uh, now that PDT is uh, no longer available, uh, monotherapy is the way forward. And uh, this, uh, uh, you know, we uh, can uh, vouch for because Planet uh, told us that a flibercept monotherapy resulted in vision gains and which could be sustained. So uh, moving on, uh, if you look at the HOC uh, study, the results from the HOC study of the Japanese uh, participants, <laughs> So what we see here is that brolicizumab monotherapy showed robust uh, con and consistent visual equity gains, which was comparable to aflibercept, and anatomical outcomes favored brolicizumab over aflibercept. So the other important thing uh, Dr. Gopal also mentioned was that 76% uh, of uh, brolicizumab patients uh, could be maintained on a Q12 weekly uh, dose. I'd like to bring in this uh, publication from my friend, uh, Dr. Ashish. And uh, he goes on to say that brolicizumab potentially penetrates better at the site where polypoidal lesions are commonly located. And uh, brolicizumab is, su is successful in higher polypoidal regression in cases of PCV. So uh, we've had uh, many other publications, mainly from Japan regarding PCV. And this was a short study which showed that there was poly regression that was uh, noted after brolicizumab in 78%. Moving on to another study from Japan, uh, this is, uh, they showed, uh, Ito et al, they showed a resolution of 93% and uh, dry macula at one year was 73%. And their mean number of injections uh, over a year was 6.4%. So they mentioned that uh, probably we are, we were uh, you know looking at uh, redu reducing the number of uh, treatments uh, for the patients with PCV. So why prolysizumab is different because of its uh, it's because of its uh, small molecular size and it penetrates deeper and deeper penetration might mean um, might mean more effective treatment for PCV and uh, that is what probably uh, Dr. Safar was you know pointing at. So uh, I'd like to show a couple of cases first, and this is a 67-year-old gentleman to, with uh, recent onset DV in the left eye, and uh, visual equity was 618. And if you can see this ICG, just uh, zoomed up the center part, and there are a couple of polyps there. And uh, we treated this patient with uh, brolicizumab, and this is uh, two months post uh, the first brolicizumab. Uh, we actually, what we do now is uh, for PCV, we go, go for a two-monthly uh, initial loading regimen of three and uh, not a monthly regimen. And uh, then this is what the patient looked like after two months, there was still some fluid, the DLS was there, and uh, you know some hyperreflective foci, a little bit of intraretinal fluid also. So we went ahead, uh, gave the next injection, uh, the retina started looking a little better, uh, visual equity improved also a little bit, and uh, then after another two months, we gave another injection, and this is after uh, two months of the third injection. So we, at this point in time, we were in dilemma whether to inject uh, the next injection or not, or whether to wait. So uh, we did an ICG, and the ICG showed that the polyp was not really visible. So we, uh, you know, followed up this patient, and uh, basically uh, uh, we plan to inject as the fluid comes back, and that basically that's PRN, of course. So next patient, 63 year old male, and you can see this is uh, this patient has 624 part vision and uh, there's a subretinal hemorrhage there and uh, the polyp is visible on the ICG. And if you see, uh, there's this notched PED here and uh, of course, you know, this, uh, there's uh, some uh, hemorrhage also uh, subretinally. So we gave a brolicizumab to this patient and uh, the retina, the intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid dried up. Uh, and uh, this is at two months, of course, following the first injection. And the PED is still there, but it's flattening out. And we uh, gave the next injection and uh, then the next one. So after three injections, uh, this is how the retina looked. The PED was uh, still kind of there, 
but uh, you know there was no intraretinal or subretinal fluid and we decided not to chase away uh, the you know this remaining amount of PED and instead we went ahead and did a uh, ICG and uh, the polyp was not to be seen. We published our initial experience with uh, brolicizumab in PCV and this was a retrospective study uh, of course and uh, the basic uh, you know result was that uh, from 0.6 log my units it improved to 0.3 log my units so this was statistically significant 33 percent of the cohort experienced three or more lines of visual equity improvement 29 percent had two lines and uh, the rest maintained vision and nine percent actually you know uh, lost uh, two lines so this was basically progression of disease in this study we did not have any inflammation this was remember this was a six month uh, study and uh, the improvement of vision was slightly more in the naive group which is probably to be expected considering the recalcitrant case cases uh, you know uh, have not been uh, you know where maybe uh, dry so uh, so uh, if you look at the disease activity results uh, the uh, subretinal fluid actually it resolved in 47 percent of the cases and it reduced in 53 percent the intraretinal fluid it resolved in 59 percent and reduced in 41 percent and the PED it resolved in 24 percent and it reduced in 76 percent and interestingly 43 percent had no fluid at last follow-up and uh, uh, Dr. Pillai has spoken about durability. So this was a, a totally PRN based, uh, you know, study. And so basically regimen that we were following and the mean injection free interval in this was uh, 12 weeks plus. Uh, I'd like to sh uh, show this patient. Uh, this is in a challenging kind of a scenario, which uh, this patient is a 72 year old. We've been treating this patient from 2016. And this patient has had one PDT with ranibizumab, 44 ranibizumab, additional ranibizumab and 5 aflibercept injections and this is how uh, he was when he was picked up for brolicizumab so this was in January 2021 and through uh, 2021 uh, he received actually four injections of brolicizumab and uh, by December this is how his retina looked there was still a little bit of you know SRF here and the PED was kind of flattening out but it was still there but he had significant cataract so we had to take a decision what to do with the cataract and uh, we put our best foot forward and we operated uh, him in January this year and post surgery we've injected three more injections and uh, he is currently he has a trace amount of subretinal fluid uh, and uh, uh, here you have uh, you know a vision that is more or less maintained some of it uh, the improvement is of course because of the cataract surgery so seven injections over 21 months and the fluid resolution you know has been there but uh, it's uh, there's a trace amount of fluid still there so uh, although uh, you know our study did not have any safety issues but uh, this is what I found on the brolicizumab.info so if you uh, take up retinal vasculitis vascular occlusion and uh, you know uh, combine all this there are 14.3 uh, per 10,000 injections so we need to be watchful and uh, uh, and treat these patients as and when necessary so I'd like to share this case that happened recently you know this is a 54 year old male with metamorphopsia at presentation and 612 partial visual and as you can see there are uh, there's this polyp here and we treated this patient with a brolicizumab injection just one injection and we had the retina looking pretty better and pretty much better but at two months when we actually called him back uh, for you know examination and for the possibly for the next injection this is what he presented with he had kps he had raised iop and so we treated him with uh, topical steroids only and two anti-glaucoma medications and uh, patients seemed to do well after two weeks the anterior chamber was quiet there was no retinal vasculitis or any posterior segment inflammation as such and uh, visual acuity improved and the IOP uh, stabilized so uh, just to give you a heads up of how we've been you know using brolicizumab uh, remember we are 18 centers and we see 12.5 lakh patients a year so these numbers are obviously going to be high and we are 21 retina specialists so 19,880 vials, 83 vials have been used so far till October and uh, out of these, uh, you know, vials, there are uh, 389 of these uh, patients uh, were NMD or PCV patients and we've had IOI in nine eyes, vasculitis in one eye and uh, basically uh, most of them, actually six of them received only topical steroids plus minus anti-glaucoma medications in some and uh, topical plus oral steroids in three of these. We haven't used uh, Ozudex in any of these patients and we haven't done vitrectomy also as yet touch wood and uh, vision has been maintained or it improved in all of these eyes. 
So to conclude, brolicizumab is effective in treating both naive and recalcitrant PCV. The durability of brolicizumab stands out, but one has to be watchful regarding the IOI. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Devlal. Uh, I think vast experience that he has shared and a lot of confidence also in publication. There is actually some data which you have mentioned about fluid based on OK activity. Have you done any subset analysis where you have done a follow up ICG and could share some light on the rate of polyp regression that you? I am assuming the uh, cases that you are showing are mostly primary treatment. I think it looks like it's a standard uh, uh, choice uh, for you now to treat with brolicizumab. So if you have any experience of polyp regression in patients who have been treated primarily with. Uh, let me, uh, uh, you know, share with you this uh, a very particular pertinent point that is, and, that's, uh, and that is, we have ICG in three centers out of these 18 centers. So basically, most of the retina guys will be treating based on the structural OCT. We have octa in four centers. So that's another issue here. So uh, I wouldn't be able to give you a number as to how many actually polyp regressed uh, in uh, all these, uh, you know, patients. But, uh, you know, uh, between these three centers, it's around 65-70% regression, if I remember right, between these three centers with ICG in naive eyes. And in recalcitrant eyes, we actually don't go on to do a repeat ICG. It's purely based on IRF and SRF resolution. We are not too much bothered about the RP. You were talking about RP rips. I have personally had two RP rips and one of them have been published also. Uh, so that's another issue and uh, I think it's an issue with all anti uh, So that is something also we need to watch out. To so know that, I have one final question. We're running out of time for Dr. Mahesh. Uh, Dr. Devdalal presented a case where a uh, patient had received four brolicizumab injections and underwent cataract surgery. So then in fact, there is an audience question also from Dr. Jashet. Um, are you skeptical about patients having to undergo cataract surgery and also receiving, receiving specifically brolicizumab? Uh, is there a higher risk of inflammation if you combine it or if you are doing a staggered, is there a time difference between injection and cataract surgery? As of now, yes, I do have research. Because now the other drugs, along with cataract surgery, we give one injection of aflibercept or the other ones. Uh, but along with cataract surgery, I don't prolysism as of now. So either you plan it uh, before cataract surgery or after cataract surgery, after a month or so, we can think about it. So along with cataract surgery, I don't have the guts to give now. Uh, uh, let me just clarify, this was not along with cataract surgery. Okay. So we did the cataract surgery. I did the cataract surgery one month post, post the last yeah. So he, yeah, I know. He, he did after the injections. Uh, but. I just wanted to know, are you... Yeah. No, we are not. Inwaz, you have any comment on that? No, uh, post cataract surgery, anyhow, we are going to start them on the topical steroids. So what the maximum we have seen in India, no, 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 none of the cases, I have any case of vasculite, the maximum we have seen is the vitritis. So after cataract surgery, when you put them on the regimen of uh, the post uh, topical steroids, so I don't think that should really be a problem as far as uh, vitritis is concerned. I'm not talking on the evidence-based. I'm just uh, talking about the protocol, what we follow. So sometimes, even if there is inflammation also, that might have been subsided. Even if there was an inflammation in other knife cases also, we have treated them with the, the topical steroid only. It is not nothing less than that. Of course, it needs to have trials and all those things. But as of now, we have given cataract with brolicizumab and they have been treated with the topical steroid. So uh, we, okay. we still do not have much evidence. You have given cataract with uh, brolicizumab. Combined, both okay. The question was basically because there was a reservation about recent injecting in recent cataract surgery patients, whether these patients have higher rates of intraocular inflammation following brolicizumab. I think there was some mitigation plan wherein uh, avoid patients with prior history of intraocular inflammation and recent intraocular surgeries is a relative, you know, um, uh, indication for higher inflammation in this patient. So there was a recommendation by the thing that avoid patients who had recent cataract surgery. Yeah, so I, I mean, my, one of my published cases in Azure where we had reported hypopion, which 
intense vitreitis. That patient had recent cataract surgery. From there also, we probably got this uh, idea that we should avoid in a recently cooperated eye where there is a pre-existing inflammation. And and if you and if you combine both together and next day, if you see vitreitis, yeah, you don't know you how to treat it as infective end of the yeah. That's 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 the challenge. One one last question. Uh, we know that now that some some inflammation is happening, and they have published that it is less than one percent of IOI which has happened through bolizumab. I think they are also working. The European experts are working. Do we have any classification like yes, these are the patients might go in for inflammation and better to avoid. Is there a characterization of these kind of subset of the patients where we can say as of now, I think it's more than a year now which has come to India. We pull all the data and if you can do that, which are the actual characteristics of patients who have undergone inflammation uh, and to avoid those in further, that thing that will be helpful for the rest of the practitioners. Sir. Raja, actually the safety committee of VRSA had been uh, asking everyone to fill the Google form that we get a uh, database from Indian uh, patients. But unfortunately, doctors are not filling up the Google form and reporting it to uh, uh, VRSA. Yeah, so if we, we are trying to get uh, at least some data so that at least we can tell okay these patients had predisposition to inflammation it will be very useful for our so i request everyone to do that if there is a uh, this is the right time to make this pitch so please uh, provide information to vrsi the data that you have but uh, before we finally close i have one last uh, question for dr amar safar uh, we are missing you, your physical presence here, Dr. Safar. Uh, I would like to mention that uh, here in VRSI conference, the food uh, variety has been so extensive that I think most people are spoiled for choice here. You know, they don't know what to eat. It looks like anti vegf is also going that way. So I want to know your uh, uh, future perspective, you know, let's say Ferisimab comes in and then 8 milligram aflibercept is there and there's so many choices and you have brolicizumab too and it's not in the near future, it's all coming early next year, uh, at least in India. So what do you think would be the future landscape when we have these long acting agents, ferisimab, 8 milligram aflibercept, safety, is that going to be the deciding factor between these three? What is your perspective? I, I think you are muted, Dr. Safa. You have to unmute uh, from our console. Please unmute, Dr. Safa. I am unmuted. Yeah, now we can hear you. Please go. Okay. Ahead. All right. So that's a very good question. And um, I think it's nice to see that we went from pretty much nothing <laughs> in the beginning of this century, except the uh, Avastin, which was off-label, still is off-label, into all of these uh, very advanced uh, uh, you know, products. So uh, we already have Ferisimab in our market, uh, which I think is okay, it's good, um, it's doing good job, but definitely, in my opinion, doesn't have the same wow effect that Brunicizumab had when it was introduced. Um, yes, it's very safe. Uh, but at the same time, again, like we discussed before, there is the issue of potency and, and potential safety issues. Um, and again, I don't want I want I don't want to walk away with the idea that prolysisumab is unsafe. It is basically a, a very potent and safe medication, I think. But it uh, has a very rare potential problems we need to be uh, careful about. So, what do, do we expect with the product, you know in, introduction of also the eight milligram? Uh, uh, Ilya, I, I, I don't know yet. Uh, honestly, the information are looks <coughs> promising. Uh, it is going to be us clinicians to actually be. Maybe studies will have to show us which ones are the better with what. Uh, is safety going to be the main thing? Obviously, are we make sure that if a patient has a, a problem, uh, then we don't that, like you said, for example, you know, surgery or yeah, this. So we will have at least options to offer these patients uh, that uh, you know. Um, it is very exciting to and uh, publish our experiences and uh, learn from each other. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Safar, all the speakers, all the panelists. Uh, have a good day. Thank you all.